We know where we've seen this before, in color revolutions funded by the United States and the European Union. What is going on in Belarus? Suddenly, there's an immense spotlight on this small Eastern European country that some people haven't even heard of before. Getting on the cover of the New York Times, primetime on Western mainstream media, even US and EU officials are discussing more sanctions on Belarus. So what's going on? First, let's give you a quick crash course on the history of Belarus. First. The land that is now Belarus used to be part of the Polish-Lithuanian Empire and the Russian Empire. The idea of the Belarusian nation was a loosely defined one, emerging out of the 19th century against Russian imperialism, which later fermented in 1905. The Bolsheviks had a significant influence on the creation of a Belarusian state. A Belarusian People's Republic was formed in 1918, led by anti-communist nationalists to the West, and the Soviet Socialist Republic of Belarusia to the east. Finally, the BPR was exiled and all of Belarus joined the USSR. And they joined as the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. In 1941, the German fascists invaded and occupied Belarus and set up a puppet government called the Belarusian Central Rada, modeled after the exiled BPR. Belarus was devastated after World War II. 20% of their population was killed, many in battle, but majority were killed during the occupation, especially their formerly vibrant Jewish population. Prior to the dissolution of the USSR, in the 1991 referendum, Belarusians voted at an 80.4% to maintain the Soviet Union. That is higher than the national average of 77%. Despite this, the USSR was dissolved and Belarus left the Soviet Union on August 25th, 1991. On August 9th, the Belarusian people headed to the polls to vote for the presidency, which was between Alexander Lukashenko, who's been the president since 1994, or the new face of the opposition, Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. Tikhonovskaya entered into the race when her husband, Sergei Tikhonovsky, was arrested for an alleged assault on an officer, which many claim to be a setup. In the weeks leading up to the election, the albeit weak opposition united and rallied around Tikhonovskaya. Ultimately, an opposition trinity was set up with Svetlana Tikhonovskaya, Maria Kalisnikava, and Veronika Tsepkal. Kalisnikava is backed by the jailed Belarusian banker Viktor Babariko's team, and Veronika Tsepkalo is the wife of Valery Tsepkalo, a former prime minister to Belarus and the founder of the, one of the largest IT clusters in Central and Eastern Europe, Belarusian High Tech Park. Together, they united as the neoliberal girl boss force in the country. But after Belarusian state authorities declared Lukashenko as the winner with 80% of the votes, the country erupted into protest. Many people calling fraud for the resignation of Lukashenko, and for free election. People poured onto the streets adorning the flag of the Belarusian People's Republic, a flag that many associate with the fascist collaborators. So why does it make its reemergence now? Well, this flag has been used for decades by the anti-communist nationalist Belarusian forces, but now it is being used as a symbol of anti-Lukashenko national pride, since it was Lukashenko who brought back the modern flag from the four-year stint with this red and white flag from 1991 till he was elected. Lukashenko has been backed by the Communist Party of Belarus, which has been holding counter protests in support of him but he's also been criticized by a sector of the left like the Belarusian Left Party. During Lukashenko's tenure, while all the major industries are state-owned, the Belarusian people have free public health care, there is reduced higher education, and they have a reliable transportation system thanks to the Soviet Union, but Lukashenko has been privatizing or underfunding many of these achievements. 43% of the Belarusian workforce are in the public sector, but this number used to be much higher. Trade unions have also been crushed, and workers are being suffocated with a contract system. But even pensioners are facing austerity reforms. But what does the opposition offer to counter this? You guessed it. Neoliberal market reforms. Tikhonovskaya said that her proposals for Belarus were inspired by those of the reanimation package reforms for Belarus, the same group that wrote the proposals for Ukraine post-Maidan. While their site has been taken down, 
you can still find it on the Wayback Machine and their proposals are as ghoulish as you can imagine. By 2021, they want to privatize all the state-owned businesses, bringing in foreign investment. By 2022, they want to develop the private healthcare sector, privatize certain services covered by the public healthcare system, reduce the amount of public hospital beds, and promote the building of private hospitals. Measures that are currently killing the people in the United States, Peru, and Brazil in this pandemic. Essentially, they want to limit the state influence in all spheres of institutions and allow the private sector to control it instead. Because, you know, oligarchs and capitalists really want to help out the people. But if that doesn't reveal the Western opposition involvement, the proposal also includes for Belarus to leave the union state with Russia and apply to join the EU and NATO. A solidarity fund was created giving 1,500 euros to each striking worker that gets fired, which also include IT training for their children. But in a country where the average salary is 300 to 450 euros a month, where is this money coming from? The National Endowment for Democracy spent $1,712,389 in 2019 alone for regime change measures in Belarus. On August 19th, the EU vowed to give 3 million euros for initiatives that support the opposition in Belarus, including $2 million for striking workers. When have they ever given that kind of money to striking workers in their own countries? The EU and US have sanctions on Belarus since the 90s. The Prime Minister of Poland, Mateusz Morawiecki, announced a Polish-American program for aid called SIEM, allocating 50 million zlotys for Belarusians migrating to Poland and independent media in Belarus, such as Nexta. Nexta is a telegram channel that has played a major role in giving directions and provocateering for the Belarusian protests, while they themselves are based in Warsaw. And these are tactics that have been reportedly successful tools for, from the Polish special forces known as Black Spiders. The Belarusian opposition and their protests have the best PR team money can buy. Western governments have been pouring money into the expats and intra-country liberal news. And finally, all their efforts have been paying off. Just take a look at the 100 meter long flag that was held in Pinsk. Where are the people getting money for that? Where is the money coming for the big balloons of Lukashenko's face in red and white that can pour down blocks in the street? We know where we've seen this before. In color revolutions funded by the United States and the European Union. But what does the West benefit from regime change in Belarus anyway? Unlike Russia and Venezuela, which is plentiful with oil, Bolivia, that's plentiful in lithium, Belarus offers a market that Western investors have yet to fully tap into. But more than that, Belarus is yet another pawn in the West's game against Russia and all the actually existing socialist countries. The Belarusian government has been an ally not only to Russia, but to Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, and China. Belarus immediately recognized and congratulated Nicolas Maduro when the whole Juan Guaido puppet show was going on. Taking this government down would be a major victory for the West, especially after Bolivia's 2019 coup. They'll be on a roll. The decision over Belarus needs to be in the hands of the Belarusian workers. Those are the people who run the country, not expats in New York City or London, not the EU or United States. These are the lives of Belarusian people. They will have to live with these consequences and this will be imprinted on their history. This is not a game. But unfortunately, the left isn't as strong in the post-Soviet space to capture the rage of the people at this time, leaving with Belarusians with two options. Do you want your country to be sold out to Western investors and become migrant workers in Western Europe? Or do you want to fight another day and struggle for your country? We hope that one thing becomes clear to Lukashenko. Venezuela resisted constant neoliberal coup attempts because of the power of the working class. You must never abandon the working class because while reactionaries are paper tigers, the working class are the real deal. Solidarity with the Belarusian workers and down with neoliberal Western imperialism. Take it from us who have had our countries ravaged by Western imperialism. This will bring nothing good for you.